Good afternoon, everybody. It's Thursday again. We are absolutely, as always, thrilled to be back here with you all and you wonderful people. Dave, how you doing? Hey, good to see you. Good to see you, well. too. Yeah. Looking wonderful. You, you, your new camera setup's wonderful as well. Nice depth of field, <laughs> nice lighting. We were talking about this before. It looks great. Huh. Today's a good day because Janet Deering came in with uh, freshly baked goods this morning from uh, Casa de Deering, and it was wonderful. Can't Ooh, complain. Wow. Was, what a lucky one. It was pretty I good. We had quinoa today. <laughs> well, that's, that's, <laughs> that's your prerogative, my friend. I also <laughs> want to talk about very quickly, just because I'm personally so excited about these. Go to the website, get yourself a nice new pair of Deering socks. Okay. If you bought Tony Trishka's socks, they're the same ones, and they are the most comfortable socks I've worn in a long time. So go check those out. That's my little plug for the day. But that's not why we're here. We're not here to talk about socks or any kind of footwear or quinoa or Janet Deering's amazing baking skills. But we are here to talk about our guest today. Uh, we are very excited to welcome classical banjoist John Bullard. John is a classically trained musician and has published several books, including Bach for Banjo. For the next hour, we invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy a transformative revelation to experience the artistic marriage of banjo and classical music. Please welcome. Mr. John Bullard. Hey. There he is. Hey, John. Good to see you guys. Good to hey, see John. you too. You're in Virginia, right? I am. Wonderful. Cold, warm? How are we, how are we uh, feeling? Well, it's been cool, but today was warm and it's going to be cold again tomorrow. So that's the thing about Virginia. If, just, if you don't like the weather, just wait a few minutes and it'll change. Ah, well, that's good, though. That's the way yeah. to go. So uh, we're going to hang with you for, for an hour or so today. Thank you so much for joining us. To, we're, we're very excited to have you here. And uh, just listening to you warm up is, is <clears> awesome. But we're going to invite you to uh, open up the show with a, with a bit of a song. Um, sure. And uh, what are you going to play for us? I'm going to play a little Bach for you. This is the prelude from the first cello suite. Perfect. Awesome. <clears throat> Thank you. 
All right, that was, that was gorgeous. Sounded fantastic, John. Thank you. Yeah, it sounds great to hear that piece, uh, you know, played in the correct register, you know, the register yeah. it's written for. Yeah, the cello banjo uh, does a nice job of that. And, um, you know, it's the actual pitches that the cello plays when they play it. So it's it's nice to not have to play it up an octave. Right, right. It, it, it gets that it gets the mood across the way it was, it was supposed to be written, I think. In yeah. That, in that register. So you, so you're you're originally from Virginia, right? You're there right. now, but, but yeah, so. I'm here and from here, yeah, yeah. So you, and just kind of reading up on your your history, you you kind of you kind of stuck, came to banjo the same way a lot of people of your generation did, is listening to the Beverly Hillbilly, Bill, Hilbert, Beverly Hillbillies and uh, and uh, and Earl Scruggs playing and just being captivated by that sound, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um... I mean, the, the, I would have to also throw in dueling banjos. That was a, right. a yeah. major, you know, yeah, you know, thing. Yeah. So I was. It was in the early '70s when all that happened. It was the Beverly Hillbillies dueling banjos, and um, you know, once I heard dueling banjos, I was actually my dad. I was riding with my dad, and and that came on the radio, and uh, he had heard it before. I hadn't heard it yet, you know. And and my dad, he was a guitar player, so. You know, he 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 got all excited and pulled over on the side of the road and actually cranked up the volume and said, "Oh man, you got to hear this." So I mean, I was like really jacked to hear what it was, and then it it really blew me away. You know, the way they used to play the whole thing, you know, on on the radio, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, it the way it started real slow and did all that, it it just hooked me, and and uh, that's when you know I told my parents, "I've got I got to learn how to do that," and Somehow they found me a banjo teacher in 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 the Richmond area. Uh, I don't think it was real easy to do, you know, to find a teacher. But right, you weren't from you know around Galax or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So so they found a teacher, and we had some neighbors that gave us this kind of old beat up banjo. I don't even know what kind it was, but the action was like that high, and right, you know. Uh, but you know, it 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 worked, and. Um, my teacher, you know, his name was Arthur Rucker, and um, he's passed away now. But um, he, you know, he came and brought the the Scruggs book, and that was that's what we did. He took me right into the Scruggs book and told me to get Foggy Mountain banjo, and so we started going through that. And eventually, you went to um, you went to college for for music, but you're on guitar, was it? And, yeah, it, it was kind of a weird, I, I I went to college first at a, just a small liberal arts school and they didn't have a music program or anything, but, um, eventually this friend of mine who actually is Scott four, who is like a, I don't know how many times, uh, national champion flat picking guitarist, who's actually from the Galax area from Withville, but Scott was at the same school and we had gotten to be friends a little bit because you know he played guitar and i played banjo and he mm -hmm. you know he came running up and said hey man there's did you know there's a music class here and i said no and he goes there's a music theory class and the choir director is teaching the class and i've signed up why don't you sign up and so i went and found the choir director and said hey i'd like to sign up for the same class that scott sent, signed up for and this guy was like a crusty old guy and you know he kind of had these glasses and he looked down and he goes well what instrument do you play young man you know, and I was like, well, I play the banjo. And and he, his eyes got really big and he turned on his heel. Oh, no, no, no. And he threw up his hand and walked away. And he he like really actually wouldn't let me take the class because I played the banjo, <laughs> which is amazing when I look back on it. But it, it's right. true. And uh, it was it was kind of a traumatic thing, actually. You know, I was like, I didn't realize playing the banjo was such a bad thing until then. <laughs> Did that almost uh, drive you to to? prove could almost that memory because to to prove that you can play you know quote unquote you know you know real music like traditional music yeah like i mean it it, it 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 did because what happened was i mean in a way it did but at first my reaction was like well i'm going to learn about music and music theory on my own then and i actually signed up for piano lessons right you know like very soon after just because you know i knew 
if I could start taking piano lessons, I would learn something about music and learn how to read music. And um, then really that whole sort of self-directed study of music eventually did lead me to music school. And I, I entered, when I entered music school, I, by that point, I was kind of trying to get away from the banjo a little bit because I felt like it had such a stigma attached to it, um, which I hate to say that at this point, but that was kind of the way it was. So I, I was going to be a composition major, and I, to matriculate through the program, you had to have an instrument that you were studying. So I started studying classical guitar and um, started taking lessons on that and then started school. But um, then as, you know, this whole classical banjo thing was such an, an accident because I was kind of trying to get away from the banjo, but then one of the teachers I had in one of my classes found out that my real instrument was the banjo. And so he said, bring your banjo in and do, do like a show and tell, which I did. And when I finished playing, I just played a couple of bluegrass tunes and he came up to me and he said, hey, have you ever thought about playing any Renaissance or Baroque music on the banjo? Because to me, it sounded a lot like a lute or a harpsichord. So that was the beginning of the whole thing for me. And I thought that was the most amazing idea. Um, and I was totally, you know, blown away by that idea. And I thought, I've got to, got to do that. But I didn't know that much about music, really. You know, I could barely read music at that time. And, you know, the first thing I did was I went, well, Scarlatti's Baroque and the harpsichord's plucked. So I got this Scarlatti harpsichord sonata and, you know, looked at that. And I was, and I was like, how in the world can I play this thing on the band? You know, I didn't even know where to start or anything. Mm -hmm. And, um... So, and, and right then, right about then, school let out for the summer. And then that summer, so I was kind of frustrated. I was like, man, this is a great idea, but I don't really know how to wrap my brain around that. Right. And um, that summer, I went to Galax for the first time, the Fiddler's Convention out in Southwest Virginia, you know, which is a the mecca yeah. for old time and bluegrass. And at, at Galax, I just happened to run into this guy, Fred Boyce, um, it was in the middle of the night and I was wandering around just checking out all the music oh, in the yeah, campground. Please. And I, we heard, I heard this band and I went over and was, it was a great band. Uh, I guess you sort of a progressive bluegrass band that, that Fred was playing in Their Their name was the laughing crinoids. Um, and they finished playing and then I was getting ready to head back to my campsite and Fred had gone over and sat down and started playing some Bach on the banjo. And I, I heard that. Do you remember what piece that was? It was Yezu Joy of Man's Desiring, um, which I, I can play later. Um, but yeah, I, I was like, whoa. And I went straight down and, and sat down with Fred. And I was like, man, that's exactly what I want to do. And I talked to him for the longest time. And he just turned me on to all kinds of ideas about, you know, like the Bach cello music and... Um, he kind of clued me into the whole um, classic banjo world, you know, mm -hmm. um, because they, you know, they tune their fourth string down to C and they read music. And so, you know, Fred... Can I stop you right here a little bit? Sure. Just like, and we talk shortly about the classic banjo world, because there is like yeah. some confusion, I know, about what this actually is. Yeah. Well, basically, it's the, it's the, the style of banjo playing that you know, preceded bluegrass and Earl Scruggs. And it was in the Victorian era, like, you know, mid 1800s into the early 1900s. And they were five string banjo players. Um, and they played banjos that were gut string banjos and they, they used bare fingers, but they used three finger picking. So it was, they called it the guitar style. You know, because it, it is as opposed to like the minstrel style or whatever, they were using their fingers and picking like a classical guitar player. So they they dubbed it the guitar style. Um, but they they, you know, they there were many virtuoso players who were also composers at that time, like Joe Morley was comes to mind. And they wrote gobs of music and, the, you know, the best description I think I could give of the music is it's very similar to ragtime. Mm -hmm. It's got a real syncopated rhythm most of the time. 
and but but the harmonies in the pieces are, are fairly complex and interesting so it's it's a really it's it's a very interesting style of music and it's still pretty popular today with you know they still have um some websites and and there's the the american banjo fraternity which is centered around that style of music um so it's still still going on but um Fred's point to me was, hey, here's us all this music that's written for banjo, and you can like learn how to read if you kind of just start digging into that music, and then you'll be better prepared, you know, to check out the Bach or whatever it is. Um, so, so, you know, that that was something I really wasn't aware of as much. I had seen a little bit about the classic finger style, but I really kind of checked it out more after that. Um, but but with Fred. Um, I actually ended up eventually talking Fred into teaching me banjo lessons. Um, and so I, I took lessons with Fred for about a year. Uh, and he really just, um, got me pointed in the right direction with the whole classical thing. He had, he had done so much work in the area, um, that, that it really gave me a good foundation to, to start doing it. And, and just listening to Fred, you know, I, um, you know, I would either record him playing at our lessons or he actually gave me some tapes of him playing. And I just, you know, I was, after that experience of meeting him at Galax, um, all I, that's all I wanted to do was to play classical stuff on the banjo. It's just like completely, you know, it's like the, the, the yeah. Earl Scruggs revelation all over again, only this time it was with the classical stuff so that's cool that's cool yeah. that you found your you know found the thing that really spoke to you yeah yeah i mean it's it's kind of weird it, i sort of painted myself into a corner with it because it's such a weird little niche that right. um it you know it's hard to uh to promote it and and to you know get bookings and so forth because so many uh people that that present concert series and stuff when you pitch the idea, hey, classical banjo, you know, they kind of have that reaction like that teacher originally. Oh, no, 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 we can't do that. Right. You know, it's although it's changing, it's changing a lot. It's changing a Definitely. lot. I'm actually finding a lot more people that are open to it these days. And, and the audiences really love it. I mean, I think it's more the people who, the concert presenters, you know. Yeah. I think they're a little bit afraid, you know, gosh, if I bring a banjo player in and, and my my audience, my, you know, traditional classical audience comes in, they're going to be aghast to see a banjo, yeah. you know, that I think that's just the music industry in general. Yeah. Take chances. But, you know? Yeah. But the audience, you know, when I do get to play for an audience, you know, they just, they love it. They're, they always yeah. come up to me and like, man, I never thought of that. And it sounds so right. great, you know? Yeah, totally. Um, so when was this, what, but what year was this when, when you met Fred? About? It was, um, I think it was the summer of 1985, okay. maybe 86, right in there. Um, and I, so, you know, I that was during the summer and I had just, as I said, started music school. And so then I went back to music school that fall, like, you know, loaded for bear. You know, I was like, now I know how to kind of wrap my head around this a little bit. And that's when I really started to do, to make these transcriptions of a lot of stuff, you know. Yeah, was that the hardest thing at the beginning of trying to make arrangements for, a, you know, for pieces that were written for another instrument to put, make them for yeah. the banjo? Yeah, I mean, the thing about out a way to do it. You know? The thing about Fred was that he, get, you know, hearing and seeing what he did was just like gave me the clear path of like, okay, these cello things will work. You know, mm -hmm. basically, you know, you play it up an octave. At least I knew that first suite would work. And yeah. then, so I started looking, so I knew, uh, you know, I, I knew that um, a lot of that would work. And sometimes I, I would have to change the key, but see, you know, knowing what Fred had done, you know, I, I kind of wasn't scared of it anymore. And I knew that it would work one way or the other. And, um, but I think the greatest limiting factor for the banjo is its range. You know, um, it's got such a limited range from, from low note to high note. Right. 
compared to other instruments. You know, it's weird okay. because of the violin is this teeny little instrument. Um, you know, in the band, you know, physically speaking, it's it's small and it looks like it would have a small range, but the range, the pitch range of the violin is really much larger than the banjo because of the fifth tuning exactly yeah. the tuning allows you to just really do a lot more right. and same with with cello and so right. that you know it was it took me a long time to kind of realize how um crazy the banjo was with the g tuning and the um the limit with the range um but i was kind of I was hooked on the sound that I heard with Fred and I was hooked on the sound that I got the way I was doing it. And I, I just didn't really want to get into the whole retuning the instrument, a bunch of different ways thing. Um, mm -hmm. just because I was used to doing it the way I was doing it. So, right. You weren't tempted I, to go to a, a four string banjo or a six string banjo or something. No, I mean, I just, in my mind, when I heard, you know, I would hear like a cello piece or a lute piece or whatever it was. And in my mind, I would just hear, a steel string five, you know, bluegrass banjo with finger, you know, the Scruggs setup. I would hear that, but playing the, but playing that music, and that's just what I could hear and what I wanted to hear. So, you know, a lot of people will ask me, why don't, why don't you play without finger picks, or why don't you use uh, nylon strings, and you know, mm -hmm. um, but I just have, you know, I started playing Scruggs, you know, and I, I just like that incisive sound and i think it makes the the notes carry and sustain a lot better that's one thing that when i hear the classic finger style people playing they're playing nylon strings with bare fingers maybe a little bit of nail but mostly bare mm -hmm. fingers and the notes don't last very long you know they're plinky whereas mm -hmm. like you know i can make a note you know, last pretty long because of the metal finger picks and the metal string. You know, right. right. So I wanted to stick with with that setup and everything. But if you play, try to play a classical guitar piece, does it have? Does it using the picks? Does it kind of? You're just going for a separate tone. You're trying I'm going, to going for a different. It different sound it's kind of more of a it's actually kind of more of a harpsichord sound yeah really yeah. is what it is um, that's why those those Bach pieces all work so well a lot yeah too. I mean the harpsichord is plucked you know when yeah. you press the key it plucks the yeah, string yeah. so yeah. that it's got a, a real similar timbre I think to the banjo um, so going back to the range thing um, when you when you're making an arrangement and you kind of and you hit this issue with the range and you have to make an octave shift somewhere in some phrase is yeah. there a way that you i come across this just trying to you know where where do you is there a pattern that you see you know is there kind of cues to oh this is a good spot to make that jump to, you know yeah um what I, my first line of of defense with that is when I'm looking at the piece, if it's a piece I really want to do, you know, I, there are a lot of pieces I've looked at and I've to, to date anyway, said, I'm, I'm not going to try to tackle that because of the range or whatever the issue might be. But, um, if it's a piece I'm determined to play, I will try a bunch of keys to try to find the, the best key, um, that I can fit the most, notes on the banjo fingerboard with um so that's the first thing is to is because i view the fingerboard of the banjo as like a sliding scale um or all instruments are kind of like sliding scales with their their relative ranges so it's basically taking the the music and looking at the highest note and the lowest note and seeing you know where's the best place to place that on the fingerboard and um, a lot of times I'll get the whole piece on there without having to do an octave transposition. Um, and sometimes I've, I'll, you know, maybe have to do a couple of notes, but yeah, um, I guess I, I hadn't thought that much about it, but I guess, you know, there is a, a knack to finding the right place to do that so that it's not as noticeable. Right. And if it's, let's say it's just like, you have a low C one note and it's just like one 
one yeah. time or two times. Do you do you retune just to get that, or do you well do you move the whole piece up? Uh, it's so know? far, what I I either play in regular G tuning, bluegrass tuning, mm -hmm. or I do play in drop C. Right. Um, I'll give myself that, you know, because okay. that really helps actually in a lot of cases. Just having that that four string tuned down a whole step can Definitely. make a huge difference. So I, you know, and that's, you know, that's kind of part of the vocabulary of, that I'm used to is that that those two tunings. So, right. um, but so yeah, I mean, sometimes it's a matter of oh well, if I drop the four string down, I can make this work. Um, and then, but if not, you know, it's, it's about finding a new key. Like there's when a, you, there's a fugue. Uh, it's a Bach fugue that I've, I recorded. Um, and that one is in the key of G. Um, but I, I ended up playing it in C. And if I if I played it in C and tuned the four string down, I, it it works. Um, the other thing that's interesting about dropping the fourth string, which which I only discovered by accident, was that when you drop the fourth string down a whole step, you reduce your stretching by a couple of frets. In other words, like if I normally have to do this, if I you know to make this chord. Well, if I have the four string is tuned down a whole step, then it's really only this that makes the same chord. So there's some mm -hmm. instances where, you know, there might have been a wicked stretch, but if I've got the four string tuned down, then the stretch isn't quite as bad. So it kind of helps in that way as, as well. Right. And you have a book called Scales and Arpeggios for you know, for, for the banjo. Yeah. Um, and so... I know you're you're well versed in your in your arpeggios and scales in G tuning, but are, do you know them in in drop C tuning as well, just as well, or do you mentally just think this string I need to move up everything a whole step? I just do that. I mean, basically, really, what ends up happening is, I mean, some I guess if I'm reading something, you know, with the drop C, I kind of just somehow know that it's different when I'm when I'm doing that, but when it comes to like a piece that I've worked out, you know, once I've worked it out and I've memorized it, you know, it, it I just know the piece and I know, you know, I'm not thinking about, Oh, the fourth string is down a whole step. Um, but I work, when I work on scales and arpeggios and that stuff, I only do it, you know, I only do it in regular tuning mm -hmm. because, yeah. you know, it's a whole different fingering. It's a, thing. Yeah, and it's, what's the point? You know, it's. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah. the top three strings are the same. So. Yeah. You know, so that that covers a lot. You know? I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> I <agree. laughs> um, yeah, the the scale book that I that I did. Um, I guess I you know I wanted would point out that that is really a um, a study of scales for for technique most, you know, for left hand technique and to learn the fingerboard, you know, uh, which I think a lot of people when these days, I think when they, when they think about scales, they're thinking about improvising. Right. And, you know, what scale do I play over what chords and that kind of thing. And that's not where I was coming from. These scales, like the G scale, these are based on basically the uh, Segovia scales for classical guitar where he would play the major scale and then he would follow it with the relative minor uh, scale, you know, and then he would proceed through the circle of fifths like that. And, and Segovia wasn't learning the scales so that he could improvise. He was learning the scales to learn the instrument, learn where the notes were, you know, improve his left hand technique. So like my G... Uh, know is is that and you know there's a big shift right there um but 
that's, you know, that's, I, I based those scales and arpeggios on the sort of the classical model because they, right. there wasn't anything like that that had been done for banjo. So they're not really, you know, they're not to, I mean, it, it would certainly help you with improvising, but, you know, most people, when they want to learn their scales for impro improvising, it's more of a modal mm -hmm. kind of yeah. thing. And, and, you know, so it's different in that way. So talking about the the, your, the scale, the left hand fingering of the scales, it's something that's dropped in. It's a it, the, the the shifts is what, what I'm focusing yeah. on. That's used in in classical string um, st string technique, but yes. um, you know guitar players and and banjoists don't really learn that necessarily always. You know, it's not, they they eventually get to sometimes, yeah. but it's yeah. not. Um, how would you say to practice that, do you like to that shift? Because that's really hard for a lot of people to make that shift in time. Yeah. yeah. I, well, I think the first thing is, you know, the correct, you know, thumb behind the middle finger kind of, uh, left hand position, you know, with the neck. Um, I don't know if you can see that. Yeah. I'm not, kind of that, that thing and uh, kind of always have your thumb pretty much opposite your second, you know, your middle finger, more or less. Um, I think um, playing them really slowly is, is really key. Playing them very slowly at first until they're, and, and, you know, obviously memorizing them um, and playing them very slow with a metronome is, you know, and the, the goal I don't think is so much to play them fast. It's just to be able to, to play them in a relaxed kind of musical way. Um, right. And now in your right hand, you're doing all single string technique, right? For that, I'm doing all thumb index. <laughs> But I, I think sometimes um, when I'm play, playing some single string lines within a piece, I use different, I don't always do thumb and index. But mm -hmm. when I'm doing those scales, I do for the most part, unless I decided I'm going to, sometimes if I'm really brave one, some days, I'll practice them with these two fingers, like yeah. a classical... <laughs> Very hard these are my weakest you know that's my weakest action is these two right. fingers together so i try to work on that sometimes um as well i find one of the best things for right hand uh technique and stuff is to play is to play scruggs stuff well do you want to play another tune for us right now sure um I'll play um, this new one of these new preludes that's from Adam Larrabee. Okay. That um, you know he that I commissioned him to write these twenty four preludes, and this is one of those. This is a prelude in C sharp minor.
Nice. Very nice. Thanks. Um, going back to the um, the right hand technique, and so when you're playing, are you mixing up rolls, you know, single string rolls in melodic style when you make arrangements, you mean, or do you find yeah. it mostly one like single string? No, it's completely mode? mixed. Um... It's um, it's really mixed up. Um, that that piece, the opening is is obviously that's a lot of melodic. It's it's some open melodic and some closed, some closed kind of melodic stuff. Um, but that that piece was originally in E major, and I moved it to G major, for obvious reasons, and. Um, it works, but once you get into the piece, there's a lot of single string, I guess you would say. Uh, 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 goes back and forth um, and most of the arrangements are like that where I just use whatever it takes to get the notes to happen the right way um, and how do you get the tone to blend how do you practice getting that tone because they are first off like the you know the sustain of those open strings versus when you're fretting the strings yeah I pay attention to the score um, and the, and like in most of these Bach things uh, Trying to think of a good example. Like there, there's a there's a bass line that's you could call it bass line or you you could call it counterpoint. Really, is what it is. Bach has a lot of uh, of implied counterpoint, or or the counterpoint is sort of sparsely placed, as opposed to like on a keyboard you know, where the counterpoint is happening all the time, almost, you know, that you're, that you're playing a Bach piece, there's, you know, because you have two hands and, and such independence. But in these violin and cello things, he, he's, there's counterpoint still, but it's spread out a little bit, and you might not hear it, the line, you know, finish right away. But like in this, this is from uh, the gavotte from that uh, third pi violin partita. But here, so I'm sorry. That line. So that in that instance, there might be some other ways to play that. But I want I want that line to stay on the fourth string because it's very important to hear. I, you know, in that instance. So, so I think there's. It's really kind of paying attention to the music and 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 knowing when there's a line going on that you really want to keep hearing that line with the same string. You don't want it to be interrupted as it moves to an open string or a different string. Um, so that you know. Now there I did. I, I, 
Instead of going, I went to the open G. Because I got to go way up here. So if I went there, it would be impossible to get back up there in time. So, so I guess it's always a balancing act of trying to keep the continuity of the lines on the same and meaning keeping the lines on one string when possible. But then there, there are times where you just can't, you know, you, you got to make a shift mm -hmm. because you got to be up here. So you, you, that's when that open string comes in really handy. Um, so I don't know, I guess it's just a personal preference of trying to pick, picking those spots. Yeah. Um, I've heard some classical stuff done where the arranger might be determined almost to make it all melodic. Um, and to me, it you lose that uh, sense of bass line or sense of counterpoint a lot of times that, that's in those pieces. You know, it's not quite as obvious as maybe some of the, the keyboard pieces, but it's there. And um, so, I, you know, it's, it, I like, it's, a, it's a balancing act of trying to keep those lines happening when you can and but knowing when okay i gotta make a shift so i gotta use an open string kind of thing and sometimes the open strings are just great you know you know i mean that's it's great you know it's like it was written for the banjo Right. Um, so in that, you know, I think it's just kind of trying to when I'm when I'm doing an arrangement, I guess what I do is I kind of go phrase by phrase, you know, and I'll say, OK, well, I got this phrase and I think that's sounds great like that. And then I'll try to figure out where I'm, I'm, I'm going next and just sort of go along like you're putting a puzzle together, you know, trying to make it work. And then, of course, um, I don't think I've ever done an arrangement where, you know, my first uh, run through on the fingering stayed that way. You know, I mean, <clears throat> inevitably you go back and find better ways to do things. Right. Usually that happens when when you're having trouble, you know, there's a spot and you get to that right. spot. and It's always hard. I've learned to stop and go, OK, there's probably a better way to play that. And if you look right. hard enough and long enough, you'll find another way to play it. And then you're like, ah, oh, why didn't I think of that before? You know. But I, I think... but one key about that, this uh, trouble spots too, though. I was talking to Brian Cavanaugh about this the other day. He's like, um, you know, everybody has different trouble spots. Like your arrangement may not, like this one spot may not work for me. Right. And so if it, you know, to, if it's does not working, if I'm reading like your 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 you know, out of your tab book or something, and it's like this. This isn't working for, right. for me. It's not gospel, you know. You can no. You can change it. No, I think that's a really good point. I mean, um, I always encourage people to to, you know, it would almost be a great thing f for somebody, you know, even learning uh, any classical type piece, you know, to to almost examine every phrase and figure out other ways to play it because there's always other ways to play it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, what works for me might not be that great for somebody else. Um, yeah. So, yeah, great, great point there. We have somebody asking, Lisa is asking um, if your books are written in, in banjo notation and in, in tablature. They're, they're tab and notation. So okay. they, they have, you know, those notation staff, and then below it is the tab staff. So it's... And when friendly. you're creating your arrangements, how do you write it? Do you write it in, do you write down tablature or do you write down notation with, with like fret marker, you know, fret numbers or something? Yeah, I used to do both. I used to like, of course, you've got to write the notes out, or I did. I would write the piece out, and this is mm -hmm. back, I would use a pencil <laughs> back before the computer. I would write the whole thing out, um, and it, it might be in a new key, so it might be transposing from, you know, a minor third, you know, as I go along. So I'm writing it in a new key. Then I would go in and I would always include a blank staff beneath each notation staff. Then when I fingered the piece, I would go back in and put in the tablature to show myself how I wanted to play it. 
So that's how I used to do it. And that's how my books are, the, the, uh, the scale books and the, you know, the uh, Bach book and so forth. But nowadays, frankly, to be honest, I don't use tab anymore for classical stuff because it's, it kind of doesn't make sense in a way. Um, like, I feel like a, a written notation using the classical guitar style of fingering. So you might, you would put uh, numbers beside the notes that say, you know, say ninth, ninth position, you know, like maybe a, a nine in a circle or a nine P saying, so, so I know that that note is gonna be at the ninth position. So I, I'll, I, I find it more useful to use the standard notation and, and to put fingerings in the way a classical guitar score would have them. Um, because it just sort of makes more sense to me now than it used to. Yeah. And I feel like you can, you can, you can visualize the music much easier by just taking, just yeah. seeing the up and down motion. Exactly. Of it. And you know, I, when I play now, all my solo stuff that I, I always memorize those and that's not just because I've, you know, it just happens by the time mm -hmm. you finish, like, working on the thing you've you've memorized it um but when i play with i play a lot with a piano player and then sometimes we we add some strings and stuff whenever i'm playing in an ensemble i always read because it i learned the hard way i used to to try to play from memory sometimes with ensembles and it just it gets in the way if you get if you miss a note you're lost um, and they've gone on without you um, and then in rehearsals you know, if somebody says, let's try it from bar 28 at where you have that G, if you, you know what I mean? It, it just, it's not really very practical to operate right. from memory or from tab when playing. I, I feel like for me with, with an with other musicians. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, um, I mean, I work on reading every day and I have for a long time and I'm not great at reading. Um, but I work on it every day for a few minutes. I'll read something that I've never seen. I, I wanted to mention um, this book. I don't know if that... It's another yeah. Mel Bay book by a guy named Frank Bradbury. And this was written years ago. I'm sure Mr. Bradbury has long since passed away. Um, but this book, it's, it's, um, it's basically a banjo method but it's in the style of that classical, that classic finger style that we mentioned. So it uses the drop C on the fourth string, but it starts from scratch with how to read music on the banjo. It's like a, it's like from the very beginner standpoint. And I always encourage people if they want to learn how to read on the banjo to get that book. Um, and, and then I, what I did that worked for me is I would look at a page a day and I would make myself read that page, whether they're just little examples or whether it's a little piece, like an etude or whatever. I would just make myself read that piece, just one page. And and I would make sure I didn't memorize it. You know, I didn't want to be, mm -hmm. you know, well, I'm just right. reading it. I don't care how long it might take me an hour to read one page, but I would do that. And then the next day I would go to the next page and I went all the way through the book. And then when I finished, I went back to the beginning and I did it like three times in a row. And that sounds kind of crazy, but I, I learned how to read on the mm -hmm. banjo doing that. And then um, then a great thing to do is to get something like this. I don't know if you've ever seen. Uh, yep. Yeah, yeah. This a, a lot of jazz people use this, but right. it's they're just melodies, um, and they're 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 done with rhythms that that you progressively have to count a little bit harder, you know. Um, and I think that's one of the keys to reading is to make sure you're always counting, you know, one and two and three and four. And, you know, so many people, Definitely. me included, I'll start counting, but then I go on autopilot. And then before you know it, you're you're lost. You have to keep counting. But this book is great for teaching you how and very they're very short little examples. They're just like two lines of music. Very easy in the beginning, but then progressively get a little bit harder. But it teaches you to just, you know, count and and read. And one thing I would mention is, you know, the banjo is a transposing instrument like the guitar. Mm -hmm. So 
I think of middle C when I'm reading and, and when the banjo players in like this book in the classic finger style, when they write a middle C, they're, they're playing, they're indicating the fourth string drop down to C as middle C. Right. But in the real world of actual pitch, that's middle C. Right. So it's it's transposed so that the music fits better on the page. On the staff, yeah. On the staff. Um, and that can be extremely confusing. And to me, for me, for a while, I was always kind of like confused. Am I, am I doing transposition or am I doing actual pitch? And I couldn't, it didn't really matter once I got the piece, you know, arranged. But right. now what I do with these little melodies is I'll read them... I'll read it down there and then I'll read them in both octaves just so I kind of, you know, don't, there was a, I remember I was working on a piece that it was a, it a I think it was a Telemann partita that I recorded and I wasn't sure whether to, it was an E minor, I wasn't sure whether to have that be home or that be home and I ended up um, playing it an octave, I played it at pitch, which was up here. Yeah. And, and it really, like, I was like, oh, wow, there's this whole other other octave up here that I need to get to know better. So I've been working on that. I play a lot of, uh, as it's just turned out, I play a lot of oboe music from the Baroque era. And um, some of that I, I read at pitch. Just because... Um, I guess I guess it's in some cases it's to make it fit, and, but in some cases it's just sounds better to play. You know, it it sounds better in that area. Right. Um, right. So, well, these are great tips. I mean, those books and and practicing your rhythmic reading is is fantastic. Banjo players often because you know learning fiddle tunes or it's just or Scruggs tunes where it's just a stream yeah. of eighth notes. Um, right. There really isn't much rhythmic variation. Um, but yeah, I will say just to real quick back to the the notation versus tab. When I want to, when I'm thinking about bluegrass, I can only look at tab because bluegrass makes no sense in standard notation. Yes, definitely. You know, having going back to the fifth string you know, all the time. Like, <laughs> To write that out, I mean, there's just no way to really write that in standard yeah. notation. But when you see the tab, you go, oh, that's that lick, right. you know, so. Definitely. Uh, I, it's weird, but when I'm when I'm thinking about the classical stuff, it's all notation. But then when I'm thinking bluegrass, it's all tab. And it's weird like that the two thing. genres, you know, fall out differently, but they really do. The, the bluegrass is really more about um, knowing these different licks and how to put the licks together. Um, and so when you, so when you see the tab, you know, that's that lick, you know, that's, right. you, know, you know, whatever the lick is, you can look at the tab and go, oh, that's that lick. Um, whereas, but, but to write that out in notation would just be a nightmare, you know? Right. <laughs> well, we have a number of questions I want to, um, okay. I want to get to, um, Dan Mazer has, has a couple, he's, he's, Hey Dan. Saying, does all the pieces in, in Adam Larrabee's Preludes keep the fifth string at G? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then... uh, there's one piece uh, that's going to come up in the... I've recorded Volume 1, which is Books 1, and Books 2, which is Preludes 1 through 12. That's coming out in January, on January 20th. Um, and that So that's the first 12 Preludes, and then I'm going to do Volume 2, which will be the, the second... But in uh, there's one piece in volume two that he's going to, I think he's going to make a note that you could tune the fourth string or the fifth string to F sharp if you wanted. But I, I play it, you know, I, I just kind of stood my ground and refused to retune. That's one of the things we did with the preludes was we decided that we wanted to operate in all 12 keys, major and minor, without changing the tuning. You know, that was kind of the challenge of it. I think you're the fourth Deering Live guest that's talked about Adam Larrabee and and this upcoming <laughs> book. Um, we've had Wes Corbett, BB Bonus, Jake Sheps, and now 
yourself. Yeah. Um, well, I commissioned I'll, I commissioned him. Uh, it's been a while now, maybe three years ago. I uh, can't really remember, but you know, my teacher in school, my classical guitar teacher, who event, only studied classical guitar for about two or three semesters before I got into this banjo thing, and then my teacher was really cool and helped me with the classical stuff on ban I would take my banjo to my lesson and eventually I got the degree with the banjo so it's a long story and it was quite a struggle but I, I finally got him to do it but um my teacher always told me he said you know if you're serious about the classical banjo eventually you need to commission composers to write new music for the banjo because you'll never you know you can't just live on transcriptions of old pieces forever you've got to get new music yeah. going you know and that's kind of the tradition that Segovia started of commissioning, you know, Taroba and Ponce. And um, so, so I had commissioned a couple of pieces that um, never really worked out. One was kind of never finished and was impossible to play. The other one really wasn't playable. Um, so I was back to the drawing board. And so I, I ended up, um, Adam and I met in music school or through music school. He went to the, he got his master's where I got my undergrad. And um, so I knew Adam through that. So I went to Adam and um, we, you know, he was really interested in the idea and we, um, you know, Adam's just a, just a great musician all the way around and a really talented composer. And he thought it would be cool to um, start, you know, with, with a 24 prelude idea, which, you know, harkens back to Bach, but then, you know, many, many instruments nowadays have their set of 24 preludes. It's kind of a tradition to do. And um, so he thought that would really fill a gap and, and, and lay a foundation for the instrument that, that would be there forever. And um, so that, so we, you know, we've settled on the 24 preludes thing and it's really turned into a longer project than we ever thought. I mean, the preludes are harder than we thought they would be. Certainly I harder than I thought they would be. Um, mm -hmm. And Adam, I think they're harder than Adam really intended them to be, or some of them are. Um, some of them are not hard at all, but um, we decided that to just kind of stay with the spirit of the, of the project and the pieces that he's written are so cool that I just didn't want him to change them. So, so we've just kept forging ahead. And um, I'm really happy with the CD that's going to be coming out in January. Um, and um, yeah, so it's it's kind of the never ending project, but we're plugging away. Nice. It is, but the tracks that I heard were, you know, are fantastic. So. Oh, thanks, thanks. And then I've heard people, you know, people on Deering Live have been playing pieces from it. Yeah, <laughs> for, yeah. For so bit. he's yeah. he's got the first book out. So the first six preludes. And I'm hoping I'm, I'm thinking that when the CD comes out in January, that has the first 12 preludes that he'll get the second book out so that he's kept up, you know, because they're written. He just, I think, you know, he just has to format the, the mm -hmm. book stuff, you know, and I think yeah. he and Jake are working on that um, together, sure. but. Um, and uh, let's see, Dan Mazur has another question too. He's asking okay. what tab writing software do, do you use? I, I don't, I use Finale, you know, notation yep. software. That's right. And I just, okay. it's just one I've used. I've, I've heard people say Sibelius is, is more flexible or whatever, but I, I just, I know how to work finale and I it's what don't feel like to learn it. Yeah. Don't want to yeah. learn anything else. Um, let's see. There's, um, Julie Colton is saying, I would love to hear an arrangement of Rodriguez concerto de Aranjuez on <laughs> banjo. Have you ever done something with that? No. Uh, that was, those would be big shoes to fill. Um, you know, that piece, it's a great piece. Um, you could probably do it. I mean, there, you know, there, there, again, there's a range problem, but you could probably make an adaptation for banjo. But I have not <laughs> wanted to tackle that yet. Um, let's see. Do, you, you don't use nylon strings, do you? Because there's a no, question I've about stringed. nylon strings. Right. Yeah. Okay. Somebody was asking what... what um, what brand do you use? But. Now the, the cello banjo has all wound strings on it, oh, okay. you know, um, and I just, for that, I use the, you know, instead of trying to cobble together strings from classical guitar sets or whatever, I just buy the gold tone. They have cello banjo strings okay. for four string or five string. I just buy those. So gotcha. uh, these strings that I use are, uh, uh, 
uh, straight up strings, the Simonoff, Roger Simonoff strings. They're expensive, but I, I kind of like the way they're kind of, yeah. I like the way they feel sound. Well, this has been fun. I could keep chatting more and more and more, but, uh, we're kind of at the top of the hour. Um, yeah. um, we'll definitely look out for that recording at, right. in the, in the new year, January, yeah, or January you know 20th. And where can we find it? Do you think on all the regular, um, yeah, the regular like Apple stuff. music and Spotify and whatever. Yeah. And you know, it'll be on my website. Um, but yeah, all the regular Amazon, iTunes, all that kind of stuff. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Well, John, it was, it was great to great yeah. to meet you. I, I've had you know I've had your your Bach book for for a long time, and and oh, and, good. Uh, and uh, worked out of that. Definitely learned things from that. Good. Um, good. So yeah, well, thanks uh, for having me. It's been it's been fun. Yeah. Want to uh, let's see before we go to uh, next week. We'll be off. It's uh, Thanksgiving. So happy Thanksgiving. Right. And then uh, the week after, we'll be having um, Bob Taylor from Taylor Guitars in okay. talk, coming in and talking about uh, the American Dream uh, company that him and uh, the story with him and him and Greg Deering. So uh, right. everybody show up for that. Would you like to play us out now? Sure, sure. I'll play out. Speaking of Bach, maybe I'll, <clears throat> since I talked about Fred and and being inspired by him, I'll I'll play one that 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 you know I heard him the first thing I ever heard him play, which was Yezu, Joy of Man's Desiring. Perfect. Here's that drop C tuning, drop fourth string. <laughs> 